Um, but I did want to get started because we have a really wonderful agenda and some really wonderful intelligent researchers here to talk about sustainable futures. Um, so my name is Vanessa Mason. I'm a research director here at Institute for the Future. Um, if you are not familiar with IFTF, we help people think systematically about the future. And today we're going to be thinking systematically about sustainable futures. Um, this is uh, part of our Ask a Future series, which is an ongoing series that allow all of you to be in conversation with all the amazing futures researchers at IFTF. Um, drawing upon their expertise across a wide range of topics. Um, this series is sponsored by IFTF Vantage, our organizational partnership program. If you want to learn more about IFTF Vantage, uh, I'm sure we will have information at the end of this. Um, but for now, I want to turn things over to Joseph Press, who's going to get us started with what does it mean to design sustainable futures? Oh, thank you, Vanessa. I'm really excited to be here with my colleagues, Quinn and Ilana. We're gonna be sharing today uh, some of the materials that were actually part of a forecast that was done at the end of last year, climate positive organizations. And what we're gonna be bringing to that is some opportunities to actually transition to a more sustainable future, to be more climate positive and also to begin exploring how can we understand what is that spectrum that Bob Johansson, myself, and Christine Bullen are writing about the, the choices that we need to make between being net zero and regenerative. So I think we're all aware of the challenges that we are facing in this decade and in the uh, Vantage program, we are referring to this as a decisive decade. And we've seen how supply chains have deteriorated with COVID and now with the war in Ukraine, water shortages, health risks, weather conditions, and consumer backlash. And someone mentioned uh, more is less, and I'm sorry, less is more. And that is actually a very good book that we recommend about the notion of degrowth. But we're not gonna get into some of those high level headlines because as futurists, we're actually quite excited about finding opportunities to be able to design a sustainable future in a way that will enable us to move towards action. And in our world today, we have so many opportunities to really think differently about the future. And what we do at the Institute for the Future is try to understand how can we envision a preferred future, a better future, specifically when we're talking about climate. We do need to change our existing situation into a preferred one. And at IFTF, as the longest running uh, forecasting independent strategic group that's located in Palo Alto, but has a network global, which is I'm part of that, based here in Zurich, Switzerland. What we want to do is to help organizations, communities, and individuals think systemically about the future. And specifically, our passion is about thinking systemically about a climate positive future. Now, we practice and teach strategic foresight. And strategic foresight is all about being able to imagine those transformative possibilities. And we believe that future-ready organizations are actually able to bring foresight and imagination together in an approach that we refer to as future back thinking being able to have clarity on the future, not to be certain about where we are going, but to have that clarity so that we can then begin planning and acting to transition to that preferred future. And that's why it's very important for us to be able to have these opportunities to work with organizations, to work with leaders in those organizations, to be able to see those transformative possibilities. Now, I briefly mentioned the anxieties that we are 
facing today, those will only increase if we look 10 years out, which is the usual time frame that we as futurists like to be looking for. And you can actually go online. There are a couple of websites that you can actually forecast where will flooding happen? Where will fires happen? And this is based on data from today, but we know that data from today may not help us think future back. It may not trigger our ability to be future ready. So last year, one of the most important pieces of research we did was actually to forecast what would a climate positive organization look like? What would be some of the ways that organizations and leaders would be able to help prepare organizations to become client, uh, climate positive? So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Quinn to walk us through some of the key output from that forecast. Thanks, Joseph. Hi, everyone. My name is Quinn Childs. Uh, I'm the research director for the Food Futures Lab within IFTF. Um, so I spend a lot of time um, not only looking at the future of food systems, but more broadly, the future of climate. And this um, piece of research that Joseph just mentioned was um, a, a really big portion of, of our um, sort of official foray into climate futures. Um, we've been doing various projects with various organizations around the world for a while um, on the theme of what's the future of sustainability look like? What's the future of, um, of climate and um, climate consequences look like? But this was the first really big um, cohesive um, systemic look at that. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the research itself, and then I'll show you some examples of what we say when, when we mean we're doing uh, foresight work with a specific organization. Um, but, but this work overall was uh, a part of the, our 2021 um, annual research report. So it was a, a big piece that looked at um, what are the, the overarching principles of climate positive organizations? What does it actually mean to be a climate, climate positive organization? Um, as well as some forecasts on different areas. So looking into the future of technology, economics, um, social governance, um, and, and how those might um, transform given a climate positive future. So it was a, it was a whole bunch of reasons. Research and, and unfortunately, I don't have time to get into all the uh, nitty gritty details today. Um, but I did want to pull out just um, these five principles for transformation um, that we uh, identified as part of the work. Um, so they are uh, the first one is is um, to distribute responsibility for climate action. And, and these five, when I say five principles, these are sort of the um, basic. Um, the, the basic blueprints that a climate positive organization will need to follow in the next 10 years as we see this, um, this decisive decade really unfold. So distribute responsibility for climate action um, is just um, encouraging organizational leaders in these groups um, to build a sense of psychological standing, a sense of ownership and responsibility for acting on a problem. And as a result of that, um, ensuring that everyone in, within an organization sees mitigating the climate crisis as a fundamental part of their role so that it moves from this sort of siloed, you know, here's the sustainability department um, to a, a organization wide uh, imperative. The second is to pursue positive sum strategies. Um, and these are really um, looking at organizations um, who are climate positive, who are addressing the climate crisis, understanding that these risks, um, the climate risks, threaten to destabilize entire categories of activity, not just you know specific organizations or individual entities. Um, and so they must face systemic challenges. And to do that, they're going to need to pool efforts, share resources uh, via competitive collaboration, um, and really work together to create positive rather than negative externalities. The third is to address systemic injustices. And I saw this pop up in a number of people's uh, three words in the chat, three words of, of their climate futures, um, is that climate futures to succeed and climate organization, climate positive organizations to succeed in this future will need to understand sy the systemic um, 
nature and the systemic injustices of climate change. As the climate crisis intensifies, it will disproportionately impact more impoverished communities, people of color, um, underrepresented communities, and, and it really threatens to exacerbate existing disparities. So organizations that adopt strategies that mitigate the climate crisis while also uh, addressing these systemic inequalities, uh, that will be an opportunity in the future. And it is already now. Uh, the fourth is to employ polymorphic strategies. And what we mean by polymorphic strategies are um, organiz essentially organizations that can adopt their strategies, shift forms, um, shift approaches very rapidly to meet the demands of external change, to meet the demands of all these, um, this, this very rapidly changing system. Um, essentially, it means that the, the reverse of that is also true. Um, the, the climate crisis will punish organizations that pursue a single path towards efficiency. So polymorphic uh, approaches will they'll build on current efforts. They'll, um, they'll go beyond just resilience by really focusing on intentionally pursuing flexible strategies. And finally, we have adopt a stewardship mindset. And this will be absolutely critical in achieving a balance of, of flexibility and longer horizon planning. Um, essentially, a stewardship, a stewardship mindset um, challenges leaders in these organizations to reimagine their uh, role within that organization as being responsible, for, not just for present day stakeholders, but also future stakeholders, right? Organizations will need to make decisions with future stakeholders in mind. Now, with these five principles in mind, uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the climate work we've done in the past. Now, I, I pulled out this case study of um, some work we did about a year and a half ago now um, that was with a, a um, global consumer goods company. Um, and the basic, uh, the basic conceit of this research was, was to answer a couple questions. One, what are the overarching future forces over the next decade um, that will change the way that these types of companies have to think about sustainability, have to think about their role in sustainability? Um, this one specifically in packaging. And the second was how might these threats of, of climate change also be opportunities? How can a, a organization that works under the current paradigm transition to becoming a climate positive uh, organization through their strategy and their thinking? On the left here, I just I thought these are kind of fun. I pulled out these um, as part of this overarching uh, project. We created some sort of headlines from the future. These you know, are supposed to be articles that you might see in the year 2030 or something. And these are just to provoke um, some thoughts about how this type of you know, big CPG company um, might look different. They might shift their strategy when they consider themselves a climate positive organization. So for example, just from the headline, you can read, Walmart goes climate positive through a partnership with landfill mining company ReMine. Um, so this is just, you know, this this is um, essentially a, a provocation. Um, we call them artifacts from the future at IFTF. But this is what would it look like if some of these organizations that have been focused on um, efficiency um, and you know, yet yeah, they're addressing sustainability, but they're not yet that climate of positive climate positive organization. What might that look like in a future where they are? And part of this work, you know, th this this particular piece of work was not developed. Um, on the framework of our climate positive uh, work that I, I just talked about, those five um, principles. Um, but it, it was parallel. And I think so, sort of our history of working in spaces like this informed that work and, and vice versa. On the left here, these four, um, these four categories were the major future forces we identified uh, in this project. So um, you can see how things like distributed supply chains and waste as wealth, they, they do map. Um, somewhat to those five principles. And, and like I said, we weren't intentionally trying to map them to those five principles, but you can see when we're, we're working with those five principles sort of in mind, um, this is how we might translate them to an organization, right? So when we're doing things like um, employing polymorphic strategies, well, that's a very high level um, broad principle. But when you think about it at more of a specific level, you might come up with something like waste as wealth, right? Um, you might come up with something like distributed supply chains. How do we be more dynamic and flexible and employ those polymorphic strategies, knowing that our old strategies of um, linear supply chains optimized for efficiency might not work in the future? 
Now, as an outcome of this project, um, we we ended up um, working with this organization to really reevaluate reevaluate their sustainability goals. Um, the goal is really to say, okay, if if we do transition to something that looks like more of a climate positive organization, what are our long-term strategies in sustainability that must change? Um, what are our, our opportunities in sustainability that um, that we do see as opportunities, that we see as places that we can lead the pack and sort of um, pull the entire ecosystem uh, towards a more climate positive future? Now, I also did want to um, show, show this piece of work, our um, future of climate action work uh, that we did in 2018 with the Climate Investment Funds of the World Bank. Uh, because this is a public piece, you can actually go on our website and uh, take a look at all of the, the entire deliverables. Uh, it was a big project. We ended up creating a, a map of future opportunity zones, but we also worked with a number of artists um, around the world to create some um, climate uh, futures artworks. Um, we did a whole number of, of things that came out of this, but you can view those all on our website. Um, that's just been dropped into the chat. Um, but essentially, a brief overview of this is, like I said, we, we took eight zones of opportunity. I won't describe them all here. It would take a little too long, but you can see them on the right there. Um, and I think just from the headlines, you can sort of get a, a sense of what we're going for here. This was looking at the future of specifically how people, how individuals will take climate action in the future, right? What are the next 10 years of, of um, uh, popular movements and, and, and specifically opportunity zones of how people are taking climate action? And out of that, um, this one was exciting, and, and, and I do encourage you to go look at that full map and that full report, um, because um, th this one has some really exciting outcomes. The CIF is a, is a nearly $10 billion investment fund um, doing um, investment in, for example, you know, medium and large scale solar, uh, solar power plants and um, other climate positive investments. And after we went through this entire process with them, almost a year long of, of working with them, um, they really did some intensive reevaluation of um, their investment criteria. They were looking, you know, crossing all those opportunity zones that we presented to them with their different, um, you know, uh, their different sort of silos of how, how do we invest in urban areas and transportation? How do we invest in land use and forestry? Um, and thinking of rethinking about through excuse me rethinking through how each of those areas they can tweak their investment criteria um, for example they they already had um written in that each project has to consider um, the role of women in the project um, but one of the areas uh, that we presented to them was was specifically women as climate leaders um, and they re-evaluated their language and rewrote some of their language in that investment criteria um, as a result of this so going forward they're they're really tweaking their strategy their long-term strategy towards um, ensuring that uh, all the investment projects that they that they put their money into all the the organizations that they're investing in are truly climate positive. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Joseph. Thank you, Quinn. And wonderful to see how the forecasts have been able to already accelerate the transition of these organizations to a more climate positive future. And I'd like to call out the importance of two things. Number one, those design artifacts that you mentioned, the uh, Heinz Craft headline, the uh, speculative partnership uh, with Walmart, those design artifacts begin to actually illustrate and bring to life a plausible and in this case, a preferred future. And by having the ability to actually design these climate positive futures, we can actually begin to see how important designing a sustainable future is in relation to being able to illustrate what that future could be and what it could look like. You even mentioned uh, the rethinking of words. That's also a design exercise. And what's important to keep in mind is when we talk about designing a sustainable future, it's not only the creative act of envisioning a better future, envisioning a headline, envisioning a artist's description and depiction of what that climate positive future could be. 
it's also it's also the opportunity to engage in a co-creative process. We know through research and our experiences that transformation is dependent on having a stewardship mindset. It's dependent on thinking systemically. It's distributing responsibility. It's pursuing positive sum across a variety of stakeholders. You can really see within all of our five principles for transformation that there is a human quality to it. And this is really at the heart of design. And in order to help all of us move towards a more climate positive organization, we're really excited to share with you the opportunity that the Institute for the Future has in partnering with the Politecnico di Milano, the executive education group of the design school, where I am also a, an adjunct professor called Polydesign. And the intention of our program in the fall is to give all people, whether you are a leader in an organization, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you are a citizen in a community that is interested in creating these visions, imagining these climate positive futures, and, and really thinking about how do you engage your community members? How do you engage your organization? And how do you engage yourself for change? And so this program is going to be building on our Design Futures program, which Ilana uh, is one of the lead faculty members of. You're gonna hear from her in a second. Um, you saw the design artifacts that uh, we refer to as artifacts from the future that Quinn shared. We're gonna be applying Design Futures and we're going to be applying those to a systemic or a wicked problem. And what we have been using more and more are the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. These uh, 17 goals are aspirational. They have a clear sense of purpose, but they are not certain in how to get there. And some of the critique of the Sustainable Development Goals is that they're not specific enough. Well, we actually believe that that's why they are a great direction and aspiration for us to bring what we believe is an intention to actually come up with the right kinds of solutions and experiences that are meaningful for the communities in need. And this should help us actually understand what are the systemic needs and be able to create that possible path towards a preferred future. Being as uh, Bob Johansson always says, being clear about our direction, but being flexible on how we arrive there. And what we believe will also be part of this experience, we'll be developing some of the UNESCO key competencies for sustainability, which includes strategic thinking and systems thinking. Uh, critical thinking, and some of the basics of speculative design and design thinking as well. And what we're really excited about is bringing together experts from both the Institute for the Future and Poly Design. And from the Institute for the Future side, very excited to be working with Jake and Jacques, who also co-teach with Ilana the Design Futures program, in addition to experts from the Polydesign program. Now, what is this program and how do we believe it will help participants who are aspiring to accelerate that journey towards a climate positive world? Well, we will be beginning with having a really good understanding of where is that intention? What do we aspire to? And that's where having the SDGs, and we'll be selecting a few SDGs 
to be able to bring the participants into a space to explore, which Jake will be sharing. What does it mean to imagine a sustainable future? And we'll be covering our Design Futures program. Then in the next program, I'm excited that uh, Professor Manuela Celli uh, will be leading a class on speculative design. And this is important for us to ensure that we are always maintaining a design approach, a design mindset, which again, is all about having an aspirational intention for a preferred future, but being very flexible on how we achieve that and be aware of how do we engage others along that journey. We'll be then uh, having the opportunity uh, to be inspired by uh, Jacques Barcia. He is a narrative hacker and he's going to be sharing his views on building better worlds and using design fiction as a way for us to begin creating stories, stories that will encourage others and ourselves to begin making that transition towards a more climate positive future. Now, we will have to be able to think about what are the actual experiences? What are the actual solutions in that preferred future? And in our class number four, we are really uh, excited to have Professor Silvia Barbo, who is an expert in system design from the Politecnico de Torino, uh, which is in a beautiful area in Italy in the north in Piemonte. And she has deep experience in creating regenerative systems and ecosystems, uh, looking at supply chains and systemic design for things like wine coffee and thinking again about what are those systemic and sustainable experiences in that preferred world. We'll be then moving over to hear from Ilana, who is going to help us understand what is the art, and I think in many ways we refer to it as the dark arts, of prototyping artifacts from the future. And this is very exciting because this is where we as designers get to really roll up our sleeves and create provocations of what that future could be. As Quinn shared earlier, it can be a headline, it can be an actual device, it can actually be a meaningful story. So Alana is going to help us really ha learn how to create those artifacts from the future. Uh, then in our sixth class, uh, we'll be uh, hearing from the Vice Dean of Poly Design, Professor Anna Meroni, and she is an expert in participatory design. How do you cultivate a movement? Again, transitioning to a climate positive future will require a movement. It will require engaging people to make the changes, either the changes in personal consumption, the changes in organizational production, and certainly how communities recycle and begin to think about being regenerative. From that, we will look at a very exciting and emerging field of story making. And one of my colleagues and co-authors of a book that's going to come out at the beginning of next year called Story Making, Professor Tomasa Buganza is going to introduce us to story making as a way to engage stakeholders across the system, to be able to cultivate that movement with a story that will bring people in and motivate them for change. And then lastly, I'll be sharing my experiences and learnings from my mentor, Bob Johansson, and his body of work, most recently, Thinking Full Spectrum, uh, and we'll also be bringing in some of our insights from the book that we have just submitted the manuscript uh, for called Office Shock with our other co-author, uh, Christine Bullen. That's gonna be coming out at the beginning of next year. So our program, Designing Sustainable Futures, 
will have the opportunity to preview uh, some of this work because we really do think to lead the journey towards a climate positive future, to be able to engage others, to cultivate a movement and really make organizations climate positive, you have to have the ability to think full spectrum and you need to be able to use the literacies of future back thinking and the mindset in a way that will enable you to pursue that aspirational climate positive future, which should have more social justice, which should have more climate impact, which should have more collective purpose. It should also include more belonging. Those are the catalysts that will help us create a more climate positive world. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Ilana. I mentioned her work in the uh, Design Futures uh, program, and I'm really excited to give her the opportunity to share her experiences in designing a sustainable future. Ilana? Thank you so much, Joseph. Um, and. Quinault and Vanessa for the intro. And um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to talk about this project. Free Space is an initiative that I co-founded um, almost 10 years ago, actually. And I think that it brings together two elements of sustainable futures um, that I think are really important. One is community. And one, um, as Joseph mentioned with one of the courses for the Designing Sustainable Futures course, is participatory design. Um, and so participatory design is engaging the people who are affected by a problem or a challenge, engaging them in the, in the entire process of coming up with the solution. Um, and I think this is an important approach to designing sustainable futures because you never know where your best answer is going to come from. And the people who are most affected by a problem often have the best ideas for solutions. So ways that you can engage them in kind of visioning what a sustainable future would look like. I think is a key component. Um, and then the other the other one that I mentioned is um, that, that I think is an important part of, of sustainable futures is community. And there's actually a sociologist named Eric Klinenberg and his work, um, his work has shown that community is the difference between life and death in climate emergencies. Um, I'm going to say that again because I think it's super powerful that community, strength of community and connections is the difference between life and death in emergencies and climate chaos. Um, so free space combined both of those elements, community and participatory design. Um, I'll just share briefly what it was. Um, this is a building in San Francisco, in downtown San Francisco, that was on the market for $25,000 a month. Um, for those of you who are not based in the Bay Area, that sounds totally crazy, but it is quite normal for San Francisco real estate prices. And I was working with a group there were about 10 of us and we managed to get this building for one dollar um, and turned it over to the community with this invitation of this is your space what do you want to do with it what do you want to see um, and so it became this hub of community of culture of participation of art um, we had muralists come and paint the walls people were allowed to do pretty much anything they wanted in the space as long as it was participatory and as long as it was free. So we had hundreds and hundreds of people coming from all walks of life. Um, we had folks from the tech community, we had local unhoused neighbors, we had folks from government, from business, all coming together in this space to create together, to participate in projects together, everything from adult coloring clubs, to paella making, to uh, silent disco dance parties, to book clubs and it was a space where people got to do things together. Um, and another thing about it in terms of its connection to sustainability is it was highly localized. Um, and so it built community again across across different neighborhoods, across different communities in San Francisco, um, where people were allowed to kind of work on something together. We, we, we said, you know, there's this whole movement towards DIY, do it yourself. Well, in this space, we want to DIT, we want to do it together um, because there's something about building together that strengthens community and that allows you um, to exist in the face of challenges. 
it's just a, an example of what, or a, a, an image of what the inside looked like. So we had all these things happening all at once. We had, you know, people were allowed to paint the mural, uh, paint murals on the walls. We had hackathons. Um, someone put the, the earth rising, um, a poster on the wall as a reminder to us of kind of where we are in the world and, and what we're trying to do together. And um, it was also this kind of extreme example of reuse and circular economy. So everything in the space was was donated. Um, we even had a, a, a garden in the backyard, um, or excuse me, in the parking lot, and all of the garden beds were donated from a previous temporary community garden that had to shut down. So it was this, yeah, extreme reuse, um, building on the theme that Quinal talked about of waste as wealth. So we were able to use things that people didn't need or want anymore um, to make this space inviting and usable. And then um, just really quickly, some of the, um, a couple of the lasting impacts. This, this image, um, the very top is the building right when we got it, so completely empty. The middle one is free space in its full heyday of um, murals and activities and bright colors. And through our activating the space, there was a local nonprofit, a local arts nonprofit, who had been displaced from their um, from their buildings twice. Um, they had been they had been kicked out because of rising rents and gentrification. Um, and they saw this building in use, and they said, "Hey, we can use this for what we need and want to do." And so they were able to secure a ten year lease. On the building so keeping the building in community hands um, keeping art and culture vibrant in the neighborhood um, bringing joy I, one of the words i put in my and i saw a few other people wrote this too in my three words is i think a sustainable future needs to be joyful there's so much doom and gloom um, and we need to we need to be joyful we have a right to be joyful as we are moving forward into the future so um, i was able to to maintain that and then a few other um, real estate developers actually in the neighborhood saw what was happening there and they started adopting this ethos of kind of activating vacant spaces, making sure that their buildings were bright, were in use. Um, and the city, the city of San Francisco even um, wanted to replicate this in other neighborhoods and looking at how can we, um, what are some, some ways that we can creatively reuse abandoned buildings or vacant buildings or temporarily use them, um, which is another, of course, another element of creating sustainable futures is looking at what we have, looking at the assets that we have um, and putting them to good use. So that's my, um, that was the, the example that I wanted to share. Thank you, Joseph, for the opportunity to talk about it. As I mentioned, this was something I co-founded almost 10 years ago, but I love, um, I love being able to share and see how it inspires people. Um, we had a, a student in one of our classes recently, actually, who um, was inspired by this and took the idea to her workplace um, and is trying to create uh, the elements of a free space and kind of a, um, a participatory hub within her, um, within her company. So thank you. Oh, wonderful. And Ilana, it's just an, a, a fabulous example of not just designing a sustainable future, but actually starting to contribute to building a better world. I'm curious, what is the one insight that has stuck with you since doing this and as you work with so many other organizations across the globe to design more sustainable futures? Yeah, I think um, again, it's the it's the importance of participatory design and inclusion in creating something. So from you know this this again was a very um, radical and extreme example of that, but complete inclusion of the community from the outset. So we went in and and basically got this building, had the infrastructure, but very little structure beyond that, and so invited people to contribute to it. And in doing so, it, it there there was so much buy-in from the community because people were making the building together or they were making the project together. Um, and so it, it was able to bring, it was able to bridge divides across um, some pretty high tensions that were exi that existed in the city at the time between um, the, the tech companies who had recently moved to town um, and nonprofit communities who were like fighting gentrification. So I think the, the idea of participation um, because every you know everybody is gonna everybody is and will continue to face the impacts of climate change and so it's something that we can't do individually we need to do together and if we can figure out ways to participate together whether that's in our local communities or collab 
pre-competitive collaboration among companies or other ways that we can participate um, and invite in participation from a broad group of stakeholders, I think is is an important thing to remember. No, no, absolutely. And, and I, you know, as a uh, longtime designer, uh, architect, and professor of design, I always like to remind not only uh, my students in the graduate schools that I that I teach in, but also you know the organizations that we in the institute work with, to remind them that design is not about a product, it's about the process. The product will be an outcome of the process. And what you've just described and what we've seen here is a great example of the outcome, the product, as a result of that participatory process. And there's a big difference between design and art. Design is social. Art doesn't necessarily have to be social. You can do art on your own, you can't do design on your own. So thanks so much for bringing that to life. And the reason that we think that you know, designing sustainable futures is one important way to help all of us accelerate our climate strategies. So as a wrap up, and then we can get to uh, some questions. We really do encourage everyone to build your climate strategies by deepening Climate Plus awareness. As I mentioned, uh, the uh, forecast that uh, Quinn walked us through and climate positive organizations as part of our Vantage program generated a number of very meaningful and insightful conversations, uh, both within the Institute for the Future, across the, the, the ecosystem, the global ecosystem, and then external experts as well. So we'll post all of these links to the YouTube videos uh, and I think you'll find something in there that will be also, that'll be insightful, but also inspirational on your climate positive journey. Now, we, as uh, our mission is to make the world a better place, and we believe making the world a better place happens by creating preferred futures. And so we offer a number of ways to help accelerate the climate positive journey uh, that you may be on as an individual, a citizen uh, of a community or as part of an organization, uh, creating a roadmap for transformation uh, is certainly an important element to have once you know what is that opportunity. And the opportunity is you can see one, two, three, or even you know, longer kinds of workshops where we are very active in trying to create a stimuli to have foresight on what are the signals and drivers that are influencing the climate trends in your community or for your organization. Uh, and then being able to take those signals and drivers and turn them into insights, which then will inform action using this future back uh, approach. And that future back approach should ideally land with a transition plan. And the transition plan will always be very clear about where you want to go, but having flexibility on how to get there. Uh, because in this decisive decade, there will be many, what we've referred to in our office shop book, many mules, many unexpected occurrences. We are still very much in a VUCA world with climate impacts, but also war and pandemics, and who knows what else is going to be coming. So please do reach out to uh, any of us you know, for more information about this or just to have an open conversation. Uh, and then as a reminder, the Designing Sustainable Futures program registration is limited because it is a pilot program again in the fall 2022, uh, and you can click on the link uh, or use your QR code to get an overview. And we're happy to answer any uh, specific questions that you may have about that. And we always uh, like to encourage everyone to always keep in mind, our mission is to spread strategic foresight and foresight thinking. 
And as part of our Foresight Essentials program, we have a wide variety of learning opportunities to increase your capacity for insight and action. Okay, so we've got 15 minutes and would love to turn it over to you and have a conversation about your questions and insights and inspirations for designing sustainable futures. Yes, yeah, so we have a few questions that have both come in chat as well as some that were submitted with registration. So I'm gonna to try to weave them in where possible. Um, but we did have a couple of questions that are kind of just thinking about the scale of this. Like obviously the climate crisis is a crisis everywhere, but it's not visited equally upon all regions of the world. But just a question about how can this kind of work and this kind of thinking be expanded with other collaborators in the region, particularly as you think about, you know, the kind of, you know, most rural, most vulnerable, sort of, you know, least, you know, technologically connected, like how can we think about reaching those um, areas? Yeah, I think it's a critical question because we are talking about a systemic challenge and it is very much a wicked problem. And I do think it'd be worthwhile, Lana, if I could put you on the spot, tell us once again, how are you able to engage a variety of stakeholders from the real estate market to building owners, to community leaders, to be able to bring them together into that sustainable future? Yeah, sure. And I think, I mean, I think the answer is actually much bigger than just what we did with free space, but it gets at the uh, at what Vanessa was at the question that was submitted that Vanessa um, posed. And it took a lot of intentional outreach of saying, okay, who who are the people who are coming here naturally and organically? And who are the people who aren't coming here? And why aren't they? And kind of this idea of, you know, we need you need to add a chair, you need to add a seat to the table for people whose voices have been left out. Um, intentionally and unintentionally and invite them. And if they, for whatever reason, can't or don't want to come to the table, you have to bring the table to them. And so go out and find where people are and engage with them and get a sense of what their, you know, what their worlds are like, what their challenges are like, what their, what their ideas for um, the future are like. Um, which is not always easy, especially if, if you've been living with crisis after crisis after crisis, it's really difficult to envision the future. And so thinking about ways that you can engage people, whether that's through art or creativity or other ways of kind of um, um, initially bringing people into a world where they are allowed to um, and able to envision a future, um, I think is an important part. So it's really about, it's about intentional inclusion. Um, and that comes from understanding who has been excluded and why, and making a point of centering those voices in the conversations. And just adding on to the intentional inclusion is also conscious choices of when to engage with those segments. And for many of us who have been involved with innovation, we know that there's not a lack of ideas out there. There's not a lack of a preferred future but it's having a shared understanding. And that has to be co-created. That has to be designed in a gradual way that isn't too large, but isn't too small to feel exclusive. And striking that balance, uh, I think, as you said, uh, Elena, is, is a challenge, but that is definitely the art of designing sustainable futures. Well, it looks like from chat, uh, Mara was saying that she, She's been working with a community called No Esta Todo Intentado. Um, so like everything is not invented. And so like that's kind of a new like maker space and a kind of innovation space that might be an interesting kind of collaboration and thinking about these kind of complex issues. Um, yeah, so let's see. Um, the next question is, Sort of on this broader question of, you know, you know, a lot of what you've talked about is certainly like design fiction and like designing experiences, but this one was specifically around like changing behavior. Um, so I know that obviously like these are systemic problems, but trying to get people to maybe um, change the behavior, you know, thinking more specifically things like consuming less, like how do we sort of change like consumer preferences and buying patterns and sort of, you know, getting people to fix things more often than replace them. Like I'd be curious, kind of curious, like 
how to think about behaviors as opposed to more higher level points. Wait, I'm curious to hear uh, the research on client positive organizations and the pillars. How did they or how do they provide insights onto how to help trigger behavior change? Yeah, so obviously behavior change is a big part of it. Um, and I think there's a well established conversation between, you know, what's the individual behavior change that needs to happen versus the larger systematic um, or systemic changes that need to happen. Um, I am, am personally a little bit more on the side of um, individual behavior change sort of flows from the um, the larger system. Um, but I do think that preparing for um, individual level behavior change um, um, preemptively or proactively um, is is a really necessary, it's a necessary part, really, right? Like there, there are two things that sort of have to happen um, at the same time. Um, and it's a really fruitful space for something like futures thinking um, because individual level behavior change is both, um, like I said, it, it both comes from the larger system um, and it's it, it helps accelerate a wider movement towards um, climate positive organizations, climate positivity in general. Um, so a lot of projects that we do end up thinking a lot about like, whether it's consumer behavior or um, social behavior, you know, whatever aspect of individual behavior change, um, because that's a really illuminating space for futures thinking um, to say, okay, we can, we can see all the different ways that people might act in a climate positive future. Um, and how can we enable those or enable the ones that, you know, are good and, and that we want to happen? Um, and how can we prepare for them at the same time? So it sort of lets you approach um, thinking about um, what does the climate positive world look like? You know, organizations, institutions, individuals, society, systems. Um, it, it gives you a really good toehold into um, looking at all of those different aspects. Yeah, I think the key word that you mentioned is, is thinking. So the future's thinking is going to influence thinking in the present. And what's underlying that is the neuroscience. So behavior change has to trigger some new synapses. And that's one of the uh, powers of speculative design and design futures, uh, being able to actually embody being in that future. And recent research, which we will be talking about in the Designing Sustainable Futures course as part of Bob's work on full spectrum thinking is tapping into the social synapse. And so what are the connections that we share neurologically? And that's where the real challenge is, but we also know that's where the real change has to happen. Consumer can reduce consumption only if production reduces production. Production is only going to reduce production if consumer is going to reduce consumption. Mm -hmm. And so being able to span that spectrum uh, is something that we'll be exploring. And no easy answer, but a good question. Definitely. Uh, let's see. I think I see another question in chat that it looks like it like, links to this. So uh, what do you see as the role of communications, messaging, narrative change in projects like this? You know, and then I think there's an example of, you know, how might we get like sort of a, a Walmart or an Amazon, you know, a major retailer or a major consumer goods organization to sort of hop to the future now rather than kind of riding out that first curve. Well, I'd definitely be curious, Quinn, you mentioned the work that you led and, and I, I was involved in with that CPG company. What do you think the narrative or the story was that enabled that conversation and that catalyst towards more sustainable practices in that organization. Yeah, that, that one was a perfect example. And, and um, there are others out there, but, but this one is just uh, such a great example because it was such a um, narrative heavy project um, in that it, it was all about um, convincing internal stakeholders and, you know, getting some of that research out of just the, you know, the sustainability folks, right? There's a sustainability team within there um, that had to convince a lot of other people in the organization. Um, and it, the, the narrative around that was, was really useful, the narratives that we helped them sort of create. Um, so, so we created this body of research that was what does, um, 
sustainability or does climate positive, positivity look like in the future? Or what, what are the ways that it could look very different from today? And then building narratives and convincing people that this was not only a possible future, um, but also a plausible future, um, and also a, a future that they would want to move towards, right? Uh, because it's very easy to say like, hey, let's all you know switch to, to solar energy or whatever and everything will be hunky-dory um but but if you don't frame that as an opportunity if you don't frame that as hey here's here's the reason why you would do that and here's you know how it's an opportunity for your organization and all the different things that it affect then it's not really going to take hold um so those like headlines from the future that i showed earlier um those were one of the narratives and and honestly and and the reason why we picked you know specific organizations in there like i showed the example of walmart walmart there's Kraft Heinz, there's a whole bunch of different um organizations in the cpg space um it's because uh, uh competition is still a, is still a strong motivator and so that was the narrative that landed in some cases there now that's not always the the narrative that lands that's not always the narrative that is convincing people so um, within that same project you know we had other narratives around um the how how consumers will change their preferences right um people in the future who are and, and we've done this in another recent project with with um with a large um automobile uh, manufacturer who are really looking at um how will um consumer sustainable consumer behaviors change over the future um, and, and what's the narrative there? So what's the change from the consumer angle? We can do what's the change from, we've talked a lot about pre-competitive collaboration, right? Um, what is the narrative of these big organizations? And I see this um, discussion going on in the chat about how we need this sort of top-down systemic change in order to enable individuals to make changes, right? It's not it's not the burden on each one of us as individual people to make these big changes. The, the burden really should lie on these um big organizations and, and ecosystems and um so so looking at a narrative of of say uh, pre-competitive collaboration of how can organizations work together in new ways so that they can address these big challenging um systemic problems that none of them could address individually Truly. so just just i think that the role of narrative in these is is finding the different angles that work here and sometimes they are, you know, sometimes that angle is, hey, this was is a more competitive future if you do it like this, or your your competitors will do it first, and so you should move fast. Um, sometimes the angle is, hey, society and the way that people view these problems will be very different in the future. Sometimes the angle is, hey, there's an entirely new way that we can organize to address these, and we want to be the ones who lead in that space. There's a whole bunch of different angles to get there. And, and designers, I think, Alana, you mentioned uh, human-centered design. That angle that you're referring to, Quinn, is really about empathizing with someone in that complex system. Right. And then co-creating or making a story that gives them the opportunity and agency to be able to envision a narrative of a new future. Right. And again, design, we think, can play those, have that human-centered focus and also begin story making, because it's not going to be about storytelling anymore. We've got AI engines that can tell great stories, but it's going to be about co-creating and making a new story that will ideally help mobilize stakeholders uh, across these complex systems, now, very much in the way that uh, Ilana shared with uh, Free Space. Vanessa, I see we've got a minute left. Yes, I was trying to think of a good um, closing question, but maybe just close with, you know, what what are like the one major takeaway that you want to be sure that everyone's walking with today, walking away with, you know, if they're really centered on designing a sustainable future, what is the thing that they one must do and the one thing that they must tell someone else um, to kind of be more interested in this? I, I think the one thing that we all need to do is use and leverage and amplify our innate capabilities to imagine and create sustainable futures. And then second, that theme that uh, Ilana in the example of free space is be very conscious about the choices of when do you engage, who do you engage with, and you will always have to cultivate the arrival and the stations along that path of a climate positive organization and a climate positive world. No easy answers, but I think we're all 
realizing that we need to mobilize ourselves to begin an urgent transition to more sustainable practices. Uh, Quinn, Alana, do you have one, one that you want to add? Go ahead, Alana. Sure. Yeah, I think um, there's no one solution and remembering that um, that climate affects and impacts all of us. And so there's um, so many different ways that we can address the, the, the challenges and we need to find the one that's right for us, um, both as individuals, but also as the sidebar chat is happening as organizations and institutions. Um, and, and we need to um, find multifaceted solutions, this, this idea of polymorphic strategies or multi-solving um, because climate is such an intersectional, touches so many areas and is such an intersectional issue, we need to find the root solutions um, that are that are going to help us address these intersectional challenges. And I think great uh, connection with uh, urgent uh, optimists. I think that's a wonderful place to continue the conversation. We really do look forward to uh, having you join us on this climate positive journey, either with the uh, great resources that we have at the Institute, the learning modules, the workshops and other support that we can provide. And ideally, uh, as part of the Designing Sustainable Futures program, which we're really excited about coming in the fall with our partners at uh, Poly Design. All right, everyone, we are two minutes past the hour, but I want to thank our fantastic panelists, Alana, Quinault, Joseph, uh, amazing. I hope all of you are feeling energized to deal with this wicked problem and hopefully uh, get your communities involved as well. Um, and we will see you on the, the next uh, webinar, hopefully, or in part of this course. Um, but have a wonderful day, afternoon, evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world. And thank you so much.